the thought that came to me was the people of Israel think about what they saw with their eyes from the moment Moses came in to Egypt and went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. They saw the ten plagues, the lice, the boils. They saw uh, the hail mingled with fire, the frogs, the flies. They saw uh, the water turned to blood. They saw the firstborn. They saw the destroyer coming. They saw darkness in Egypt. It was so dark you could feel the darkness. That's, that's, I, believe I believe that, that Bible, that's, that's not, not a, a, I don't, I don't think, think that's a, a metaphor. metaphor. I, don't I don't think, think that's, that's an exaggeration. exaggeration. They, they felt, felt the darkness. darkness. But, but in Goshen, Goshen where, where they, they were, were total, total light. light. Okay? okay? There, there is, is no astronomical, astronomical event that, that describes that. that. There's, There's nothing, nothing in the heavens, heavens that, that does, does that naturally. naturally. You understand what I'm saying? God just put darkness over the people of Egypt while the people of Israel went in light. Then, once they, after the firstborn died, they left. They saw the Red Sea open up and they walked across. They saw the Red Sea collapse on their enemies. They go to Mount Sinai. They see the visible presence of God on top of that mountain. They see the mountain on fire. They hear the thunder. They hear the, the trumpet sounding. And they hear the voice of Almighty God. They receive the fiery law written by the very finger of God. What do you think that would fetch at an auction? Uh, yes, this piece of paper Abraham Lincoln spilled his coffee on. Do I hear one million? Okay. The, the very handwriting of God, Him, I bet it looks great. I bet it don't look like mine. They saw that. Yeah, they saw the visible presence of God in the form of the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. For 40 years, that pillar was there constantly for 40 years. They saw that. They saw the ground open up and swallow. Um, who was it? Um, Korah. Moses' first cousin, you look at the genealogy, it was Moses' first cousin, Korah was, went against his own family. They saw that. They saw all of these, they, they were fed by manna every single day. They would wake up in the morning and there would be manna laying out all over the place. And they would just go out and gather as much as they needed for that day. They saw that with their eyes. And yet the people of Israel are the most unfaithful people when it comes to trusting God. So when the Bible says we walk by faith and not by... See, that just hit me. You would think that the people who actually saw the miracles with their own eyes would believe in God and trust Him, but they didn't. Then you've got us, some 4,000 years later... Reading about it in a book that everybody else says this is a, just a book of fairy tales and myths. And yet we believe every word of it. So the Bible's right. We walk by faith. They walked by sight and they never made it to the promised land. Not the real one. We read the Bible. We see the miracles in here and we just believe them. That's why I said there's no astronomical event that allows for absolute utter darkness in one place and then like a wall of darkness stops and then there's light in the land of Goshen. There's nothing, there's no way that you can explain that in a natural laws of physics way. It was an absolute miracle, right? Okay, so they walked by sight and perished. And all God asks you to do is walk by faith. We haven't seen those kinds of miracles in our lives, but we read about them and we believe them. Amen. It's good to be here tonight. First Peter chapter four, turn there. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
First Peter chapter four. A couple of Wednesday nights ago, we had a we were doing a study on the will of God, and almost right after uh, I got done teaching, a thought came to me naturally when everybody's gone. So I've had to hang on to this for two weeks. Because we've been studying what is the will of God. And we see from the Bible where it says God is not willing that any should perish. However, we know that people have perished, are perishing, and will continue to perish. So does that mean that God's will has no power or force in this earth? No, because it occurred to me that there is, I believe, a difference between the will of God and the plan of God. Think about that. The wi God's will is his true desire. When God sent his only begotten son to this world, he did so because he truly wanted all men to be saved. He truly wanted that no one, he would, he would not have to send anybody to the lake of fire. God truly wants that. After all, we are his creation. We are his workmanship. We are designed by God, made by God. Everything about us and everything about this universe has the signature of God all over it. And so God wills that people go to heaven when they die. But God knows that that's not going to be the case. So God has a plan. All right? Because I was asked the question couple weeks ago I brought this up somebody had called me and and they were they were getting some counsel from me and I was trying to do my best and they asked me a question so you're saying that it is the will of God that this happens and I had to stop in my tracks and I had to think about the answer that I was going to give I not really thought about that before but is there a difference between what God desires and what he plans? And I think the Bible is going to tell us yes. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. First Peter 3, 17, for it is, and, and what I, I've got here is the verses in First Peter where he mentions the will of God. First Peter 3, 17, for it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And then down in verse 19 of chapter 4, wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. We were talking in my office about people that we knew that died that knew they were going to heaven. And you had mentioned somebody that heard music. Who was, was that? That wasn't your dad, was it? It was. No, that was a friend of mine. Okay. Okay. This man heard the prettiest, most beautiful music. And he said it. Do you hear that music? This is the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life. James Bond's. Melissa, my mom was there the night that a man, we had a spy next door to us named James Bonds. Okay. He was a double knot spy <laughs> and he was dying of leukemia, but he had asked the Lord into his heart. And on the night he died, he said, do you hear that? What? That music. That's the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life. That singing I just can't get over that. That, and I absolutely believe it. I absolutely believe it. God's people know. God, God's gonna, God, you are not a child of darkness that that day would overtake you as a thief. 
you're children of light, that that day will not overtake you as a thief. Now, you may not get a year's warning. You may not get six months warning. But I think you're going to know the day. Okay? Because I've been with people. I've been with them. And I can look back and say, they knew the day. They knew the day. So anyway, let, uh, let the, wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God for wisdom. Heavenly Father, trying to understand your mind is like to most of us trying to understand how brain surgery works. We just, we don't get it. Or how quantum physics actually works. We don't understand it. But Father, your book, your word is full of your wisdom. This book is the mind of God. Its words are right and true and perfect. And from this book, we get a glimpse as much as we're able to understand. We get a glimpse of you, Heavenly Father. And we know Jesus. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, for I and the Father are one. So you sent your Son down here to give us an idea of who our Father really is. And so, Father, grant to us wisdom tonight, as much as we're able to understand. And, Lord, I know that at one time I asked you to reveal everything in this Bible to me. And then I grew up and realized that it would take eternity for me to understand everything that's in this book. And so, Father, I understand, God, that there's not much that we do understand. But, Lord, as much as we are able, give us comprehension. Give us understanding of the God who knows our future. Lord, just give us a glimpse of your mind, your will, and your plan. Give us understanding of it. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Second uh, Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, this verse here, we, and I'm kind of backing up a little bit because it's been a couple weeks, but this verse here tells us that God has a will, which is His desire for all mankind. His desire for all mankind is that nobody in this world would perish in the lake of fire. But that every man, woman, and child would come to repentance, repenting of the sins that they committed, asking God to forgive them, and God granting them forgiveness. Because God said, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. Raise your hand if God has done that with you. Amen. Would God do that for your next door neighbor? Would God do that for the guys and gals that you work with? But has he? No. And the chances are that most of the people that you know outside of this church are going to die and end up in the lake of fire. So what about, why didn't the will of God come true? Because it's God's desire. Remember Ezekiel 33, we read where God, it, he gets no joy out of the death of the wicked. It grieves him when a wicked person dies because he has to sentence them to everlasting punishment in the lake of fire. And God does not want to do that. The Bible says, for God so loved who? The world. The, meaning everybody in it. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in His sight. God so loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, I came to the understanding that there is a difference between the will of God, which is His desire, 
And the plan of God, which is God knowing the outcome of every event, past, present, and future, here on this earth, and even in eternity. God knows, think about this. God can look ahead into eternity and know what's going to happen in eternity. Now, eternity is without time, or it's above time. And I already I'm feeling fuses blowing in my brain. Because I'm trying to process this, and I don't get it. But that's God. God has a plan for this world. Um, turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. The Bible says, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to what? Read that. Read that to us. The course of this world. This world has a course to follow. The world, the word world in the Bible, it is understood that the word world includes all the people who are living in this world. The world applies to all the civilizations, all the kingdoms, all the people, past, present, and future. God is aware of everybody in every event and every outcome. And God has set this world on a course. Okay? Uh, let me just throw out a question to you. Did God know that Adam and Eve were going to be doing what God told them not to do? Did God know that? Did God already prepare for that event? Did God already establish Jesus as the Savior even before Adam and Eve sinned? Wiki, wiki, wiki. What is that? Okay. <laughs> That's just a funny ringtone. I just got tickled at it. Does, what was I saying now? Back, huh? Okay. Did God already establish Jesus as the Savior even before Adam and Eve sinned? Yes. Because the Bible says, describes Jesus as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Meaning that Christ's death was already guaranteed. His sacrifice was already guaranteed. And I've got people who write me every now and then. They don't like some of the things I say. Uh, and they say, how could, how could Abraham uh, attain heaven by grace through the blood of Jesus Christ when Christ hadn't died yet? Excuse me. Christ's death, according to the Bible, has always been... He was slain from the foundation of the world. It's, it's not that Abraham sinned and God forgave him and he was covered by the blood of Jesus... Well, how can I say that now? He was saved by grace through faith even before Christ died on the cross because God had already taken Abraham, established him as being righteous, imputed righteousness to him before the foundation. God already knew it. There is a plan for every event in this world, God already has it planned out. Did God know Pharaoh was going to be as bullheaded and stubborn as he was? In fact, the Bible specifically says of Pharaoh that God basically made Pharaoh the way he was to show forth his power. You see, God even uses all the bad guys. To fulfill his plan. Now is it God's will that Pharaoh perish? No. But God knew that he was going to. God knew that he was going to be hard headed. And so it fit God's plan. So when you look back at your own life. And you see 
those terrible things that you did. Could that possibly have been the will of God? No. But when you look back at it, from your standpoint now, seeing that those things that you did is what brought you to the place where you said, I'm not a good person and I think I'm going to hell. Raise your hand if you know that. All that stuff that you did is what led you to the cross. That was God's plan. Does that make sense to everybody? His will is that nobody perishes, but we know people perish. So God's plan is that some will perish. Some will, with their evil deeds, basically bring about the very plan of God. Think about the book of Revelation in the last days and the rise of the Antichrist. God gave a commandment that said, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. But in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 13, the people of the earth make an image to the beast. Is that God's will? No, but it's God's plan. Because with that, God is going to separate who's on the Lord's side and who's on the beast's side. With that, that's how God's going to... He, remember, Jesus is the shepherd who divides the sheep from the goats. And he does it with his plan. In the parable of Matthew, Matthew 13, turn there. Well, I like this. I don't know about you. I like this. I like trying to figure God out. Because then when I get something figured out, I'm going, okay, but what about... And then I got to start all over again. Amen? That just keeps it interesting. Matthew chapter 13. Uh, look at verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man with so good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and so tares among the wheat and went his way. Was God's will was he sowed good seed into the earth. Did God want that bad seed mingled in with his good seed? No. But did it fulfill his plan? Yes. Or it wouldn't have happened. It would not have happened if it wasn't in the plan of God. So remember the verse, all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to his what? Purpose. See that word purpose? So maybe instead of plan, I'll use the word purpose. Have you ever done something on purpose? Have you ever done? <laughs> John said a lot. Have you ever done anything on accident that you shouldn't have done? A lot. What's wrong with you? That's our new deacon here. Okay? A lot. There's things you've done that you went, uh, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean it for it to come out that way. And you really didn't. But then the things that you said that you're going, oh, I meant to say that. I did that on purpose. Okay? So we have, I think, a difference between God's desire, God's will, and God's purpose. God's not a mean God. God is full of love and full of a love that surpasses anything that we can comprehend by sending his only begotten son to die in the place of sinful, wicked man. Okay, that's God's will. But he knows that the people that aren't going to be saved, they're going to fulfill his plan. Think of Job. Think of Job. God did build a hedge around Job. God was protecting Job, was he not? God didn't want Job hurt, but it fulfilled God's plan. And it get, the story of Job gives us understanding that yes, and we're talking about suffering in the whole book of 1 Peter, we're talking about suffering. And Job is an example of a suffering saint, somebody who suffered and he didn't do anything wrong. And it was Satan's idea. See, Satan's not as smart as God. He thinks he is, but he's not. Because Satan thought that he could make Job curse God. And God knew all along that that was not going to happen. So God's going, 
Go ahead. And then Satan's like, you're not going to kill me? No, I'm not going to kill you. Go ahead. Uh, you're awfully um, sweet about this. Ah, don't worry about it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hurt him. Hurt him real bad. I don't care. Hurt him. God knew all along that Job was not going to curse him. So it fulfilled the plan and the purpose of God. Galatians 1, chapter 3. Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. So God's will is to deliver us. God desires to deliver us from this present evil world world so aren't you happy that you are part of the will of god and you're you're saying to god god i volunteer for you to deliver me out of this present evil world while the rest of the world says we don't believe in god there's nothing wrong with this world it's and if there's anything wrong with the world it's you religious christian fanatics so we like this world and we like humanity and we're going to make humanity better and, and we're going to make this world better. We're going to do it with our own hands. And God knows what's in the heart of man and that also is the plan of God to allow man to come to the fulfillment of his wickedness. And the fulfillment of man's wickedness is the beast, the Antichrist. The fruition of man's sin. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all, you can turn there, please, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth what? The will of God abideth forever. Because what is God's will? God is, God's will is that all men come to repentance, that all men saved, are saved. And you have joined in with the will of God. And that makes God happy. I mean, yes, he's got to punish a lot of people. But he doesn't have to punish you. Okay? Romans chapter 12. Turn there. Romans chapter 12. Turn those pages. Let's get a little revival going here. Romans chapter 12. Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect, there it is, will of God. See, we're the ones, and, and I don't want to present this as this is this is something we should brag and boast about but we're the ones elected by god to show the will of god think about what that means so god is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance so you are living proof that god really does want to save sinners because you're one of them and according to the same some things i've heard from people you know you're the worst of them i just made that up but you're a terrible sinner and you are the example of what god wants to do in a person's life if you ever talk to somebody about jesus do not elevate yourself Elevate God Amen. and say to them, believe it or not, I was way worse off than you are now. And God reached down in the pit that I had dug for myself and he pulled me out and he set my feet upon solid rock and I'm there to stay. And if God can do this with me, I believe God can do it with you too. And you've just shown to the world the good and acceptable and perfect will of God.
because God is not willing that any should perish. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's what I just said. Don't ever elevate yourself above a sinner. Don't do it. I have a firm, solid belief that there are a lot of sinners out there who, if they had the right example given to them, they would trust Christ. It, meaning, if they watched and they knew your life, and they, let's say, John, they knew you before, and then they saw you change, and they saw that you don't carry a pack of cigarettes around anymore, and they saw that you don't get drunk anymore, and they saw that you don't curse anymore, and they saw that the things you used to do, you don't do no more. For the Lord made a change in me. That's a song. Okay? So they see that. They are seeing the good and acceptable and perfect will of God done in your life. And they say to themselves, or they might even say to God, God, if you save John, how come you don't save me? And God will save them. God will save them. For I say through the grace given to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. First Corinthians. Here's Paul's. Let me just kind of go through these verses very quickly. Paul always presented himself as being part of the will of God. Paul's apostleship was the will of God. Who was seeking who on the road to Damascus? Was Jesus, was Paul seeking out Jesus? Oh, Jesus was seeking Saul. So it was the will of God that Jesus intervene on that road to Damascus. Step in and say, Saul, Saul, why perse persecutest thou me? And Saul was changed. That, and he went around telling everybody what happened to him on the road to Damascus. Amen? It, it's, like, it's like you... Who, if people knew you back in the day, they knew that you hated church. You hated churches. You hated preachers. You hated, you hated preaching. You hated Bible stories. You hated all that stuff. And now you become one. Okay? And people see in you the will of God performed. So Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. 2 Corinthians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Ephesians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Colossians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. By the will of God, by the will of God, by the will of God. It, Paul's life was nothing but the will of God. Even when Satan hindered Paul and stood against him, Paul was still an example of the will of God. His life, his calling, his apostleship, it wasn't Paul's calling, it was God's calling. Mark chapter 3, turn there. Oh, I like this, I like this. <laughs> and, yeah, the Pope doesn't like these passages here, I know that already. Why do you say that, Pastor Mike? Well, let's read it. Mark chapter 3, verse 31. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without sin unto him, calling him. And the multitude said about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother. Who's the mother of Jesus? Mary. Who does the Pope pray to? Mary. Look at what Jesus said here. Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother? Or my brethren. And he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. That kind of knocks Mary out of it, doesn't it? So... Our Pastor Mike, are you saying that Jesus is not in heaven listening to what Mary tells him to do? That's exactly what I'm saying. Amen. You don't pray to Mary. Okay? Mary's praying to Jesus. Okay? Uh, Acts chapter 13. 
Mm -mm -mm. Acts chapter 13. Turn there quickly. Acts chapter 13. Verse 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And it's concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, which means he said it this way, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. That means he died. And was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. And what he's teaching here is the difference between David and Jesus. The passages that we see about David, the real David is Jesus. David is just a prototype. I mean, think about, um, think about da the story of David and Goliath. The Bible specifically says concerning David, where did he keep the stones that he picked up that he was going to put in his sling? It was a certain type of bag. What was it? It says a shepherd's bag. So David was a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So David is, is like the prototype of Jesus. And, and they're, they're telling you that all those passages concerning David are not really about that David. It's about the new David. Because Ezekiel, what is it? Ezekiel 37, when it talks about the dry bones, that later on, it says that David, my king, shall reign over them. Well, according to this, David saw corruption in the grave. His body, whatever's left of it, is still, his bones are still in the ground somewhere. But God did not allow his Holy One, Jesus, to see corruption. So he raised him from the dead. Now he is the true David. The real king who is, I mean, think of Jesus. Truly, he is a man after God's own heart. Amen. Jesus qualifies for that more than David does. But David served, and this is you. This is you. You serve your own generation by the will of God. Raise your hand. I already know one of you is going to do it. If you would like to have lived in an earlier time in this country... Back when men were men and women were women, right? Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Caleb asked me the other day, Dad, do you think they'll ever build a time machine? Nah. But it would be cool if they did. Because the generation that I live in, I don't like it. I don't like living in this world. But... God selected you to live in this generation. He put you here at this time to do the will of God for this generation. As, as good as it would be for us to go back 100 years or 200 years, it's not going to happen. So let us serve God our generation by the will of God. And then when it's time for us to leave, we'll leave. And I promise you, the place that God has for you in the future is far better than what you would want to live in the past. Amen? Romans 8, this will be the last place we look. Romans 8, chapter 26. Likewise, See, all of these things, I want you to pay attention. Because these are things that God is teaching you 
about His will for you in this generation. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. When you pray, pray, Father, whatever you do with my life, let it be your will and not mine. And I'm going to, I have to throw this in here because it was Finnis Dake who first started this. And it's been repeated by all of these name it, claim it, prosperity preachers. It's even written down in, you know, these life application Bibles. There is a Bible called the Spirit-Filled Life Application Bible. And it's written by charismatics for charismatics. And it basically gives charismatic word faith teaching in the Bible. But it's not there. But here is one section that they said. They said, never, when you pray, never say, Lord, if it be thy will. Because they say that you have just destroyed God's ability to do anything in your life. You've just destroyed your faith. You've crumbled your own prayers and now God can't do anything for you. If it be thy will. I hate that. I hate it. I hate it is to me it's an abomination. It is probably borderline heresy if not heresy. To tell people to not pray if it be thy will. It almost the way they say it, it almost makes God the slave to you. God, I proclaim my Rolls Royce. God, I proclaim wealth. You don't say, Lord, we can't pay our bills this month. If it be thy will, would you help us pay the bill? See, that's a good prayer to pray. But they say, oh, don't do that. You've just destroyed your faith. You just killed your prayer. You don't say if it be thy will, oh God. Yeah, I do. Maybe God's not going to help you pay your bills. Because maybe God's going to teach you a lesson about racking up them bills to begin with. I, I got to tell this story because this is one of those deals. My wife was right. There's a guy that I always felt sorry for him. And my wife said, you need to stay away from him. But I always, had, always felt sorry for him. He wanted to use, I had an account at a paint store. A credit account and he knew it and he was one of these guys he had run up all his credit cards he had he had run up credit accounts all over three counties couldn't borrow money if he wanted to had tax liens against everything that he had and he came to me saying I got a big paint job could I use your store account to buy some paint and I went oh no. so I finally did so he went up there and charged five hundred dollars my account and I called him, and I called him, and I called him, and I called him. And he said, well, I'm not done with the job yet. When I get done, I get paid, I'll pay you. Okay. And then I called him back. Well, I'm not quite done yet. Okay. Well, I'm not quite done yet. And then finally he said, well, I have to tell you that I lost my shirt on that job. And I said, no, that wasn't your shirt. That was my shirt. You lost my shirt on that job. And I was praying all day. I was fasting and praying all day long. That God would somehow make him pay that bill. And I kid you not. I opened up to the book of Psalms. Where it says the wicked borroweth and payeth not back. And I said God that's not funny. And I tried to read something else in the Bible. But that was it right there. And you know what he never paid that bill. Neither did God. And God was teaching me a lesson. I mean, I, I just like to be generous. I, I, but. They're just sometimes you just can't be generous. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Amen. Sometimes with certain people you can't, you can't do it. And so I had to sell off a bunch of stuff that I had to pay the bill. And I learned a lesson. God did not pay that bill. But God was going to teach me a lesson. And it was the will of God that I learned it. Yeah. And the plan of God 
that I go through that. So I'm a little, see, we only get wise by the things we get hurt by. Huh? Yeah. That's not funny, Sterling. He said, God gave you the stuff to sell off. That's not funny. I had a real nice paint spraying rig and a real nice texture machine that I used to paint houses with. Had to sell them all. I lost a ton of money selling those things just to scrape up the money to pay the bill. Sometimes God's not going to pay the bill. Sometimes God's going to teach you the lesson. Sometimes God's going to let you get hurt so that you're wiser. Amen? That's the will of God. That's the will of God. He wanted you to have that. So when you pray, pray, God, make my life conform to your will. Amen? You'd be amazed at the grace that God will give you when you let that happen. Amen?